case you guys don't know me, my name is Starhorn. I work for Honey Badger. We do exception monitoring, uptime monitoring, stuff like that. And today we're going to be talking about SVG charts and graphics in Ruby. And I wanted to do this talk, and I was excited about doing this talk because, um, well, when we use SVG, um, people, people tend to use it as uh, via JavaScript. You know, but SVG is actually quite simple. There's really no reason why we can't uh, manipulate it ourselves in Ruby. Like, there's nothing magical about SVG. Whereas, uh, the way that a lot of developers that, that I've talked to um, sort of see SVG is this, is this really complicated black box thing that you have to use all these tools in order to be able to uh, work with. But that's just not the case. So, SVG is it's really one of the, the I think one of the most amazing technological comebacks of all time. It's, it's the Rocky of uh, web standards, I don't know. And to really understand this, you gotta go back to 1999, which is the year it came around. Um, XML had like just been invented. People thought it was gonna save the world. It was amazing, people were using KDE. And if you were gonna, if you were to go down to your local borders and, and pick up a copy of XML Magazine, as, as I did, you might be forgiven for you know, being a little bit disappointed in how the web has turned out. Because I, I know I am, I, yeah. So you guys need to get to work, because I thought by now, at least I would be browsing the web in 3D using uh, VRML, you know, interacting with the birthday cake and a really creepy rabbit. This is the creepiest like, image I, I was able to find on Google, by the way. You know, but, I mean, and you can't get away from text, but I at least thought we'd be using you know, XSLT by now for all that. I, and you know, DHH didn't actually mention this, but there's some very exciting functionality being added to Rails 5. Because <laughs> who needs Haml when you have XSLT, right? Uh, but one of these standards, SVG, is actually making a comeback. It's actually ascendant. And in case you don't know offhand, SVG stands for Scalable Vector Graphics. The big difference here is that while raster graphics you know, are, are made out of pixels, and so if you have a 10 by 10 raster image and you blow that up by, to 1,000 by 1,000, you know, unless you work for CSI Miami, it's going to look like crap. But, but, but vector images are made out of math. And so they have real, no real pixel dimension, so you can scale them up or down or whatever. And that's super important lately because like, the guys who, who make computer monitors are just on a roll. Like, I, I don't know what they have, what they've been like, drinking, but I want some of it. Like, I want some of their coffee. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have Retina MacBook Pros. I just got one, it's awesome. I just got you know, a big 4K monitor for my desk and it's awesome, but all this stuff has made my life a little bit more difficult as a web developer because you know, I used to be able to export an image, like a logo from Photoshop, and be able to assume that it would look you know, equally crappy on all screens. <laughs> but, but now, if I take that logo and, uh, and view it on a retina screen, I'm sure you've seen this, you know, it looks blurry, it looks even crappier than it does on a standard screen. And so, okay, so easy fix, right? You just blow everything up by twice the size, but then you have files that are twice the size. You know, so they're, they're probably being sent over mobile networks. And then once, uh, once Retina 2 comes out, once you get your 8K Mac Pro, then you're just screwed because you have to make a whole nother set of assets that are even bigger. It's, it's not fun. So SVG fixes this, it, it makes the logo pretty. So it, the RailsConf logo is actually, uh, it's actually an SVG file, so you can go and download that from their website. But, um, annoyingly for me, Keynote does not support SVG. So this is actually a ping, it's a screenshot. Uh, yeah, so this, this thing isn't gonna scale up or down. But, in addition to logos, you can use SVG for animations, for games, for stuff that you might have used Flash for in the past. I, I know that's a bad word. You also have visualizations, and uh, D3 is obviously the big boy of this group, right? Uh, you, can, you can do amazing things with D3. If you haven't, if you haven't looked at it, 
I suggest that you, you just go look, scroll through the demos and you'll be amazed by the, just the sheer variety of uh, visualizations that you can make with, with D3. For example, like you can plot the spread of the uh, like zombie virus, the, the virus that's turning us all into zombies throughout the US if you want. It looks pretty bad for California. You know, you can, you can draw like node graphs showing the connections between all the people who've turned into zombies. And like, it, I don't know, I just gotta say like, I'm ready, I'm ready for this. Like the keynote really inspired me. So I've got a go pack in the mail from Amazon Prime. But it, it, it may not be that obvious, but D3 is actually the backbone for a lot of more prosaic graphing applications. Um, you know, graphing, uh, graphing uh, frameworks like Rickshaw use D3 under the hood to do a lot of the heavy lifting, uh, which is, is great. But, I mean, th these are a couple of little, almost sparkline graphs that we use uh, at Honey Badger in our, our user interface. We, we use them to show like uh, memory usage, uh, CPU load, stuff like that. They're really simple graphs. And I was going through our code, I was going through our front-end code, and I was looking for, for places where I could cut JavaScript, because it's one of my favorite games is to, to cut the number of, of kilobytes of JavaScript that people have to download before our site works. And I, I noticed something, which was that the code on the right, which is D3, it's, it's 100 kilobytes minified. If, if I let this run, it'll go for five minutes. Like I held the down arrow down for five minutes and recorded it. And the code on the left is the code that is, is the SVG that's being generated. And so I, I started to suspect that there might be some like efficiency gains that, <laughs> that, that we could achieve. And I opened up the, the Chrome Web Inspector. I looked at the SVG that was being generated. It's super simple. It's just XML, so I'm like, why can't I do this in Ruby? Um, yeah, and it turns out, well, it turns out to do that, you gotta know some SVG, uh, which I didn't. Uh, so the first thing about SVG, what does it look like? This is what it looks like. It's XML. You don't need a doc type or anything like that. This is perfectly valid. And to use SVG in your, your web applications, your web pages, you just, well, the easiest way is to refer to it as an image. And that's kind of cool because you get to use all your CDNs and you know, all your caching and, and it, works, it works out great. But, and this is a big but, you can't use uh, JavaScript or CSS to manipulate the, the graphics at that point because it's an external resource. And so it runs into the, the sandboxing, you know, the security stuff that the browsers put into place. However, you can embed SVG directly into your HTML. And when you do this, when you just copy the SVG document into your HTML, it works great, and now you can suddenly use JavaScript and CSS to do amazing things, and, and we'll talk about uh, some of that in a minute. First though, let's, let's take a quick tour of SVG. In HTML, and this is one of the big points I wanna get across, SVG is not that different from HTML. In, in HTML, you have uh, paragraph tags, you have heading tags, you have all these tags to describe how a document is marked up. And in SVG, you have all these tags that describe shapes and uh, you know, other graphics primitives. So to draw a circle, you, uh, it, it's kind of unintuitive, but you use the circle tag. And since this is XML, you just pass in your, your attributes to the circle, like how, what the radius is, the, the center point, all that, as XML attributes. And I've given it also a stroke and a fill here just so, to make it a little bit more uh, pretty. So in addition to circles, you've got, wait, wait for it, you've got, radi you've got uh, ellipses, you've got squares with a variety of corner rounding options. Like if you're just used to CSS, you're gonna, you're gonna be blown away, guys, by the, the corner rounding features. You've got lines, you've got polylines, which are a bunch of lines strung end to end. You've got paths, which are a bunch of lines, arcs, curves, whatever, strung end to end. You can make pretty much any shape with the path. You've got text, which is, it's text. You've got, 
And, and perhaps surprisingly, you can actually embed raster images in your SVG. Uh, you can refer to them externally, like you might with an HTML image tag. You can embed them base64 encoded. And once they're in there, you can apply filters to them. So pretty much anything you can imagine, like Photoshop doing circa 1998, you can, you can do an SVG. So here I've desaturated the image. I made it black and white. Um, you can also blur them. You can do clipping masks. Uh, you can, yeah, you can do a lot of things that in the past you may have just automatically turned to something like image magic to accomplish. Um, a lot of these you can do client side with SVG. So it's pretty cool. So now, in case you didn't hear me before, SVG elements work like HTML elements. I'm just gonna let that sink, sink in for a second. So what does that mean? Well, you can give SVG elements, uh, you can give them classes, you can give them IDs, and then once, once you have those attached to the, the elements, like you know, your circle or square or whatever, then you can apply CSS to them. You can add fills, strokes, uh, et cetera. The, the attributes in CSS are, they're different from HTML CSS attributes, but I mean, it's not really that complicated. Instead of, instead of border, you use outline. Instead of color, you use stroke, you use fill. No, instead of border, you use stroke. Instead of color, you use fill, um, and, and so on. There's, there's about five of them. And moreover, you can use JavaScript then, either plain JavaScript or jQuery, it doesn't matter, to get handles on these uh, SVG elements. And you can manipulate them. You can change the text. You can change the font. You can do whatever you can do with uh, normal DOM you know, elements. And this, this may seem like a, just a party trick, but you can do some really cool stuff with it. Uh, for example, uh, back, when I was, um, back, back when I was freelancing, I had a client who wanted to do a online sort of flyer creator, where the designers come up with, the designers come up with their templates in Illustrator, and they're designers, they don't know anything about code. And then they wanna export those and import them into the, the web app, which then, and then users can go in and customize the templates. And so you can actually do this. You just load the, the exported SVG uh, into the, the DOM and use JavaScript to insert the, the user's uh, sort of custom data into the template, and it works really well. And one other thing I just wanna bring up is that you can, you can use uh, SVG for sprite sheets. Um, this has a lot of advantage over something like a font icon because um, font icons are treated as fonts by the, the operating system, so they get anti-aliased. Um, they also aren't very semantic. You know, they use these high-level character codes that don't have any relation to the thing that they're representing. Whereas in SVG, you can say, hey, here's a shape. It's a heart. It's called heart. So draw me a heart, give it a class of red heart, and you style that with CSS and it's red. So anyway, so now you guys know like everything there is to know about SVG, but, but th this chart's actually wrong. Um, like the other half of the battle, the part that's not knowing, it's, it's not lasers, it's actually more charts. Um, so let, let's talk about charts. Like I mentioned, we use these in our application. Um, these were sort of the inspiration for this talk. And so, so let's go through and build, build these. First, let's do a bar chart because bar charts are super easy. Um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna go over this in Ruby right now because I, I hope once you see that how the SVG works, it should be sort of painfully obvious how to implement this in Ruby because it's, it's actually really simple. So a bar chart is, is just a bunch of rectangles next to one another. And so I've drawn three rectangles. Um, the range is, is, is like 50, 75, and 100. Those are the heights. And they're, yeah, they're just three black rectangles. And this is a really crappy bar chart because, I mean, first of all, it's like butt ugly. But second of all, it's upside down. And that has to do with the fact that, uh, well, SVG, like most computer graphics, has its origin at the top left of the screen, whereas most of our simple charts that we'll be making have their origins at the bottom left. And so there, there are a couple ways around this, right? 
you can add a some sort of mirror transform using SVG. They have very they have very powerful um, tools for transforming shapes. But just to keep things simple for now, I'm going to add uh, y coordinates to just line everything up at the bottom. And we'll add some styling. Uh, we'll just use the stroke, stroke width, and fill attributes. And suddenly we have a okay looking bar chart. But what about interactivity? Now imagine I want to add a, uh, when, when the mouse hovers over each bar, I want to show the value of that chart, of that bar. When faced with, with problems like this, uh, I, I tend to find that the easiest way to approach them is to just treat the SVG as if it were HTML. Like, what would I do if these bars were made out of divs and, yeah, and it was HTML? Well, the first thing I would do is I would just draw the text on the bars. And that's what I've done here. The, the code I have up there is just for one bar, just to keep things simple. I'm introducing a new tag to you. It's the G tag. It stands for group. And inside the group tag, I've got a rectangle and some text. Now, one of the reasons I'm introducing the group tag is because it allows me in my CSS to do a cool thing where I hide the text by default by setting the opacity to zero. But when you hover over the group, it sets the text inside of the group to an opacity of one with a nice little uh, uh, fade-in effect. So I'm not gonna get up here and lie to you and pretend that this is pretty or that this is anything I would, I would show to my customers, but uh, I'm sure you can see how this is a very real start to something. You know, you can make a, a decent looking, uh, a decent behaving chart out of this. So moving on to line charts. Now, line charts are going to introduce us to the scariest SVG element of all time, the path. It's pretty scary. So one of the things that makes, that makes path a little bit more difficult than um, tags like circle and square and all that is that while circle, you have these pretty obvious attributes like a radius and a center point. With path, you have this D attribute. And the deep attribute contains a list of commands, and they're drawing commands. So I, if you've ever seen like an old school plotter, like one that, that actually holds a pen in place and then moves it around, the, the path command works a lot like that. So let's step through the commands that we're passing, passing it via the D attribute. Well, first we tell it to move to 0, 010. Don't draw anything, just move the, the, the pen there. Next, we draw a line from the current position to 10, 12. We draw another line, we draw two more lines, and that gives us a really basic crappy uh, line, line chart, a little spark line. So what if I wanted to make this more of a, an area chart and I wanted to, to fill in the area underneath it? Well, so there's, there's no real CSS that tricks that I can do to make this happen. So I just draw another path I don't stroke it with anything, and I fill it with gray. And the only real difference between this path and the last is that this path is closed, and that's what that Z command at the, the bottom does. And path, path has a lot of different commands, so if you're interested in this stuff, um, I would recommend just going and finding a list of them and, and playing around with it, it's pretty powerful. So let's, let's continue making this uh, a little bit nicer. We'll add dots to where all the points are. And th those are just circle tags. I mean, so preparing this presentation, I, I kind of felt like, it's like this stuff is so dumb that I almost feel bad talking about it. It's like, yeah, it's dots, you use a circle tag. But, um, but yeah, I, I gave it at another place and, and some people had some good feedback, so. So let's style it now. Um, I'm just using the same um, three attributes as before, using the fill, stroke, stroke width. I'm applying those to the dots, to the line, to the fill. And you could make this as nice and as fancy as you wanted to. You could use gradients um, if you wanted to. You could, yeah, you could, do, you could use the same CSS trick to, uh, to show the, the values of each dot. Or you could use JavaScript for that. There's no reason you couldn't. You just uh, add a um, event handler to the dot or whatever, or add a mouse over handler to the graph. And 
yeah, and, and do your thing. So in case, in case you haven't noticed, like the, the math here is pretty simple. When I, when I went into this, this thing, I was, I was a little bit concerned about the math, but the math is, is quite simple as long as you're doing these sort of, uh, as long as you're doing these simple charts. And, and this is, you know, for the charts, uh, the type of charts that we typically use in web applications, like they're not, they don't have to be scientifically precise. Um, so uh, basic math is, is good enough. Generally, there's only two steps. You take your raw data, you convert that into some sort of graph-based data. For example, imagine I have a bunch of raw data points and I want to convert those to a scale of uh, zero to 100 because um, I want to display percentages. Well, to do that, I'd use something like a scale function. And then imagine that I need to uh, position those uh, so that the bottom lines up so that we don't have an upside down graph. You could use an invert function or something like that. I'm not saying these are particularly useful functions for you, I'm just showing you the, the level of complexity we're dealing with. So we, it's, t it's time to bump it up a notch because I was told there would be donut charts. See, Aaron isn't the only one who can make puns around here. Uh, I don't even know if that counts as a pun. I, I don't know, I have to ask my wife. So this donut chart is made up of two paths. Uh, the first path is on the right, it's, a, it's orange, and the second path is on the left, it's, it's gray. Can't get any simpler than that. These paths are a little bit more complicated than with our line chart. So first, um, if you look at the D attribute, we're moving to point 10, 0, and that's the rightmost point. Then we're telling the, the path element to draw an arc, to draw it with a radius of 10. Um, it says 10 twice because it's a circular arc, and you can actually do uh, elliptical arcs, and those would have two different radiuses. Um, there's a bunch of zeros and ones, and those are just flags that tell, tell SVG which way to draw the arc and stuff like that. And then there are a bunch of uh, unrealistically, there, there are two unrealistically precise numbers, and those are end coordinates. As a second step, we just use the line command to draw another little line inward. Then we add another arc, swinging back the other way. And finally, we add the um, Z command to close the arc. So at this point, one, once I got this far, I was pretty happy with myself, uh, except there's, there's one problem, right? I, the chart is supposed to represent um, zero to 100%, like a pie chart. But zero starts at, at uh, I guess, zero. It's, it's horizontal. And as the number gets bigger, it sweeps this way. And I'd prefer it to be like a clock, just because clocks kind of make sense to me. So I'd prefer it to be uh, where zero is at the top, and then as it gets bigger, it goes around. And I guess, you know, if I weren't so lazy, I could go back and do all the math differently and, you know, figure out the new points. But I, I, I am lazy, so I just added a transform attribute. We're not really going to talk about this that much in this talk, but SVG has a huge, it's super powerful um, when it comes to being able to apply transforms to shapes and elements that you've drawn and um, being able to control sort of the, the coordinate space. Like there's a ton of stuff you can do there. So now I'll make it uh, orange and I'll add another path. Um, this path works just like the last one, so I'm not gonna step through it, but it's just gray. So how do you get these big numbers? Um, it's really difficult, um, just by thinking about it, to, to, to come up with the Cartesian coordinates for you know, points on a circle. That, that's, that's almost impossible. But it becomes really simple when you uh, express the problem in terms of polar coordinates. Um, because in polar coordinates, well, we have four points that define our uh, donut segment. And those are super easily uh, uh, represented as you know, percentage of the circle, complete, or degrees, and a radius. Now the percentage, we know, because that's our data we're trying to represent. 
And the radius is just arbitrary. It's something we set based on how, you know, how big we like our donuts. Once you have that, once you realize that, then it's just a simple matter of plugging it into a, a radial to uh, the Cartesian coordinate formula. And yeah, and so then you get your, your unrealistically precise long numbers. So all, all this is great. How do you, how do you um, implement it in Ruby, though? Like, what, what does this look like? And I, I'm not really going to spend a ton of time on this because, well, it'd be just because it's so simple. And there's a ton of ways you can do this, right? SVG is just XML. Um, and it works a lot like HTML in that respect. You can use a builder. Um, I really wouldn't do it this way just because it's, I don't know, it's not my style. But you, know, you can use it. It works. You can uh, construct SVG using Haml. You can do it, you can, you can construct it within your HTML document, or um, you can actually create complete standalone SVG files as, as Haml. There's, there's no reason you can't. And if you want to get really sort of quick and dirty, you can just use string concatenation, which I wouldn't know anything about that. I'm just going to take a drink of water and let you guys ponder my shame. But yeah, I mean, string concatenation is ugly, but it's quick and dirty. And if you have, if you're using your own data, there's no, there's no danger of, uh, of cross-site scripting or anything weird like that. So you know, why not? It's all numbers. So I, I hope I hope I've given you a decent case for at least going and playing around with SVG, of learning what you can do with SVG. Because you know, it's, pretty, it's pretty fun. And once you learn a couple of things, doors really start opening. And it, it's something that can really, I don't know, take your front end web development to the next level, I think. Because it's a whole complex set of tools that almost nobody uses uh, for, wh for whatever reasons. Well, uh, there, there are a couple reasons, because SVG sucks at a lot of things. Um, and most of them are text. So SVG, the, the most glaring problem with SVG is that there's no, there's no word wrapping. There's no support for multi-line text, which kind of makes sense when you consider its origins as uh, you know, trying to replace the file format for Illustrator. You know, Illustrator, in that, in that context, is going to be laying out the text however Illustrator wants to. But for us as web developers, it's a real pain in the neck um, because you actually have to break up the text into spans and position each of those spans. So the, the lesson here is to avoid doing complicated textual stuff with SVG if you can. And if you can't, then um, there are some JavaScript solutions for, uh, for laying out uh, text and wrapping it. There, they're not the prettiest thing, but they work. I've used them. Uh, yeah. The, the second major problem with SVG is just that nobody's really, until recently, people haven't been using it. And so the documentation is not the most user-friendly stuff in the world. If you, if you Google around, you can find uh, recent tutorials that, um, I don't know, have to do a lot with interacting with SVG via JavaScript and stuff like that. But if it just comes down to, to learning basic SVG, like what do you need to know? A lot of times you find that, that Googling for, a, for the answer to some problem leads you to a specification page. And while specification pages can be complete, they're not really that e Like you'll, you'll wind up with stuff about uh, nested transformation matrices, like when you're just trying to figure out how to make something blue. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't work out that well. And the third major problem, well, it's not really that major, but if you have to use, if your users have to be able to use IE8 or below, uh, it, it's not going to work for you. And IE, IE9 uh, supports SVG pretty well, and more modern browsers uh, are pretty standard in their, in their implementation. But you know, even IE9, you'll find some weirdness. Like things will work, but you'll just have to do them in a completely different way than every other browser. And I, I know that that's, that's, that's weird thinking that IE would ever do that, but that's the case. 
Um, in addition, there's, you know, there may be issues um, on older versions of Android, stuff like that. So just, just understand your use case before you get into it. And if you are interested in learning more about this, um, there's a really good book. I, I just got done trashing Microsoft and Internet Explorer, but they actually published a really good book about this. So they're hypocrites. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just, I've, I've got, I'm from Seattle, so I gotta poke the people from Redmond uh, whenever I can. So yeah, anyway, it's a really good book. Um, I highly recommend it if you're interested. So, so yeah, so thank you. If you're interested in learning more about this stuff, I post blog posts occasionally and stuff, and you can, I'll, I'll post them out on my Twitter. And yeah, and that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, the, the question was, what is a good non-programmatic way to uh, build SVG if you, if you are just sort of getting started with it? Uh, well, what, when I was just getting started with it, I found that the, the easiest thing to do and the simplest thing was just to use my normal text editor and, uh, and load the file in, in Chrome. Like, Chrome can open SVG files and just, you know, do it like you learned how to develop HTML, where you make a change, you see what happens, make another change, see what happens, you know, beat your head against the wall for an hour, and then, uh, yeah. And, and so you can do that. Um, another interesting thing that you can do that I, I mentioned briefly is you can actually export um, somewhat readable SVG from Illustrator. So if you're dealing with something like a logo and you want to see how that's put together, you can export it as SVG from Illustrator. And uh, yeah, and, and one of the cool things about that is that if you have an icon or a logo and you want to tweak the color of that just a little bit, you don't have to go back into Illustrator and do that. You just open it up as a text file and change the hex code. Okay, so the question was, um, what unit were all my numbers? And I thought you were my friend, Caleb. Because that's the, <laughs> that's the question I was, I was glossing over. Um, so SVG is kind, of, it's kind of weird about Unix because it's a scalable format. It's a vector format. But a lot of times you'll see units expressed in pixels, which sort of seems a little bit, a little bit weird. Um, es essentially what happens is that SVG has a, a pretty sophisticated system for defining um, what are called view boxes. And you're drawing within those view boxes. So you can def define a view box that's like 100 pixels by 100 pixels wide. And then if you, if you draw something that's, say, 10, it will assume that you mean 10 pixels. And then, so it'll take up one tenth of the height or whatever. And once that gets scaled, it'll get scaled up in proportion. But yeah, you can also, you can also make non-scalable SVG, which is kind of, it's kind of weird. You can actually set fixed dimensions and have everything be exact pixels if you want. Uh, but that kind, of, that kind of eliminates the point a lot of times. OK, so the question is, if you have a bunch of large um, SVG files that some designer has given you, uh, how, do you yeah, how do you reduce the file size? So it kind of depends. My first step would be to open up the SVG in a text editor and sort of see what it looks like. Uh, if you're exporting from, say, Illustrator, which is how, uh, that's how the most complex SVG files I've seen have, have come to me. Uh, if, you're, if you're exporting from Illustrator, you'll find that it may be doing weird things. It may be embedding a 20 megabyte image into the, in the middle of your, your SVG file. Uh, and in that case, you might want to, you know, you might want to open up and, and Illustrator reduce the size of that image and and, and resave it. Uh, if if there's no if, if there's no obvious structural problems with the file, if there's no obvious place where you can you can get efficiency, then um, I would definitely look into. There there is an SVG. I think it's SVGZ. It's a compressed SVG format. But um, you can also serve them as, uh, as compressed files. If, if, you're, if you're loading an SVG file as a, a separate asset, you can serve it as a compressed, a GZIP compressed file. So, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure there's any magic bullets there, but, but there are a few things you can do. 
I haven't, oh, the question was um, what happens when, when the SVG files become large or do they become uh, uh, unperformantly slow? And my answer to that is, I mean, it probably depends on, on your device. Like if you're, if you're viewing it with an older Android tablet or something, then it, it's probably gonna get a lot slower than if you're viewing it on a MacBook. Uh, I personally ha have dealt with, you know, in addition to these little graphs and stuff, but I, I personally dealt with some, some fairly complex SVG files and they, they, they seem to load and perform reasonably well. Uh, I haven't done a, a lot of these like crazy visualizations where you have you know, 20,000 points and lines and stuff. So I, I don't really have any, any experience there, but, but uh, yeah, for, for smaller and medium scale files, I've, I've experienced no performance problems. Um, and, and one benefit that SVG does have over Canvas is that, uh, well with Canvas, once, it's, once you've drawn something to the screen, it's there as, as pixels, but with SVG, you at least have the ability to, in theory, sort of save it as a separate file to, to export it and then use it in other contexts at different uh, sizes and so forth. Okay, so the question was, um, would a, a complex SVG file be slower to load than a, a raster file? And uh, I wanna say it depends, but I know that's not a helpful answer at all. Um, let's take, for example, the, the uh, logo, like the, the RailsConf logo. Um, at a really small resolution, at uh, 100 pixels by 100 pixels, the, uh, the ping version of that is going, to be, uh, is going to be smaller than the SVG version probably. But uh, once you start serving larger versions of that file, the SVG file, or the SVG starts winning uh, in terms of file size by a lot. Um, so if you needed to serve like a 500 pixel by 500 pixel or a 1,000 pixel by 1,000 pixel version of that same same logo, then the SVG version is going to be is going to be a lot smaller, probably. Um, in terms of yeah, in terms in terms of complexity, it, it yeah, it, it really just it, it really it really just depends. But I've generally found that when I've replaced image assets with SVG assets, uh, the SVG is smaller. Yeah, so the question is, is SVG capable of being dynamically uh, sort of scaled, changed on the fly based on your user data? And yeah, absolutely yes. Um, there are, you can animate SVG using uh, CSS3 transformations. There are a lot of JavaScript libraries that let you do this, like uh, Snap, um, which I showed in a screenshot. And there's also, I forget the name of it, but there's actually a, a kind of clunky SVG native animation way of doing things. But, but yeah, you can definitely do this. And uh, it's like if you go to, if you look up the Snap website, I think it's Snap.js, uh, then you'll see a lot of cool examples of SVG being dynamically generated on the fly. I think D3 does that too, like for charts that are updated automatically and stuff. Okay, I don't see anybody, so if I'm missing you, yell. You have five seconds. Four, three, two, one. All right, you're free. Thank you.